Welcome back to Marvelous Videos. I'm Rylan, and today we will be taking a look at a brilliant Spider-Man horror movie that no one ever talks about. A nerd is bitten by a modified spider and gains superhuman abilities. Wasn't there a recent blockbuster with a similar premise? Yes, it was, and you can't help but assume that the producers of Earth vs. the Spider are going out of their way to dismantle every imperfection in Peter Parker. It starts as though it were a proper comic book adaptation, with lively jazzy music and pages from the Arachnid Avenger comic. The tone is very much a light, humorous, coming-of-age superhero film, almost ridiculing the impending Spider-Man film. The movie could have been a light-hearted comedy, if not for the eventual R-rated gore. It then blends humor and challenging aspects for an entertaining amount of amusement. When a bashful comic book lover is injected with an experimental serum, he begins to transform into a spider. When web-covered bodies emerge, a police officer investigates the bizarre case. Earth vs. the Spider gets off to a good start. You've got the cliched introduction to the gorgeous lady next door and the comic book nerd hero. Throw in a few requisite bullies and you're set to go. But then, the picture has the brilliant notion of discarding all chances for uniqueness and begins regurgitating the stories of The Fly and Spider-Man. Crossing Marvel's Spider-Man with David Cronenberg's The Fly, Earth vs. the Spider has humble comic book lover Quentin Kremer injecting himself with a top-secret spider serum in the hopes of becoming a superhero. He attacks murderers and criminals with incredible strength and the ability to shoot webs from his belly. Still, things go poorly for Quentin as the spider's genes begin to take control. His body begins morphing, and his hunger is pushing him to kill. Gummersall portrays Quentin, an all-too-typical sad sack man who never gets the lady. He is mocked by the local tough guys and wishes to one day be like the superheroes that he passionately collects in comic book form. It's amusing to see Gummersall change into a spider, especially the sort of spider that one to two million dollars can afford. Metamorphosis begins with a low-budget spider tattoo that extends across his forearm, keeping in mind that this is not a $20 million special effects blockbuster, but rather a TV movie, or more specifically, a straight-to-showtime movie. But the film is not awful at all. Before we get into it, however, we have a very small request. If you like our content, please support us by subscribing to our channel. This is just a small click for you, but for us, it means a lot. Thanks. Now, let's get going. Earth vs. the Spider takes place in New York. A clumsy comic book lover who works as a security guard at a biotech facility is researching giving humans spider-like characteristics. He is a timid and fearful security guard. At home, Quentin, a dull young man who lives in an apartment building, fantasizes about being his comic book hero, the Arachnid Avenger, and fantasizes about asking out Stephanie, his next-door neighbor. She is completely out of my league. When he isn't pining for Stephanie, Quentin visits his neighborhood comic book store, managed by his friend Han, where they ogle at an arachnid avenger statue and the latest graphic novel. When he arrives at work, he speaks with his fellow guard Nick, bringing up their respective romantic interests as well as the laboratory's tarantula experiments. Quentin's day is about to get exciting and dangerous when armed men rush into the lab to steal data on their newest weapons resistance research, leading to a fatal gunfight and an opportunity for the young man to inject himself with a highly classified medicine. Quentin is dismissed when his colleague is killed during the botched robbery at the research laboratory where he works, and he injects himself with an experimental serum made from spiders. His strength and talents grow initially, and he imagines himself as the arachnid superhero from his comic books. The next day, he has a high temperature and spends most of the day unconscious. After he recovers, however, he realizes that he has gained super strength. <laughs> It doesn't seem wholly new for a comic book obsessed adolescent to become the superhero he's always wanted to be. In this example, however, he practically takes on the appearance of his fictitious idol. At the same time, his desire to shed his nice guy persona and stand up for himself has all the characteristics of a supervillain. And when Quentin's health deteriorates, he creates a new persona as a crime fighter or a troublemaker. As in The Fly, the protagonist first discovers favorable side effects before experiencing a dramatic decline or a transformation. Stephanie gets attacked by a stalker late at night. Quentin steps in and murders the guy before Stephanie can see him. When Quentin arrives at his apartment, he discovers Stephanie being interrogated by Detective Jack Grillo in the hopes of finding her rescuer. The great Dan Aykroyd plays the lead detective, Jack Grillo, the first of the project's great benefits. 
He takes his work very seriously, which is not essential, yet his participation is a great option. Quentin is thrilled when he may finally fulfill his childhood ambition of being a superhero. However, as time passes, he gains more spider-like skills, such as the ability to shoot webs from his belly, and his body growing more spider-like. Quentin's appetite becomes unquenchable, yet he cannot ingest solid food. He dashes to a nearby store where he finds himself in the middle of a street brawl. Following an eventful misunderstanding in a nearby business, Officer Williams comes onto the scene and attempts to release the woman but is attacked by Quentin. The police arrive at the store the next day and discover the man's body, drained empty of all fluids, and the lady in a condition of shock. Detective Grillo is perplexed by the state of the man's body, as well as the appearance of what appears to be spider webs and William's badge at the site. William's corpse all of a sudden goes missing. Quentin isolates himself in his room, terrified of what he is becoming, as his body mutates even more, and he becomes frightened of injuring anybody else in an attempt to prevent any more murders. His fantasy turns into a nightmare, however, when he begins to acquire huge spider body parts, is in constant discomfort, and has a virtually insatiable appetite. The finest portion of Earth vs. the Spider is when it is the least inventive, with a standard setting of a nerdy man who is bashful and likes his neighbor. That setup continues with the event at the research laboratory, and Quentin injecting himself with the spider mojo, which gives him extraordinary abilities. Yes, we will admit there are some elements that are comparable to Spider-Man, but in reality it is akin to many comic book movies in which some nerdy person gains superpowers. Director Scott Zeal had a strong plot concept based on the notion of what would happen if Spider-Man took on other spider characteristics after his radioactive bite. You're reminded of extra legs, a need for human blood, and apprehension about addressing the obvious. Nevertheless, we get a lot of tangents about a cop who lost his relaxed and inebriated adulterous wife. He goes out the next night, overcome by hunger, and murders two young men who pick on him. Frank interviews the director of the research department where Quentin used to work to get to the bottom of the killing. After discovering that the killer may have injected himself with the lab serum and suspecting Quentin, Frank goes to Quentin's apartment but finds no one there. After seeing the similar webbing that he observed at the shop, Frank investigates the apartment's basement, where he discovers countless more corpses entangled in webbing. In the midst of all this, a freshly discovered love affair complicates everything. Trixie, Frank's wife, has been following him, assuming he is harboring Officer Williams, with whom she had an affair. Quentin assaults Trixie. Frank tries to save her, but it's too late, and she dies in his arms. Quentin kidnaps Stephanie and takes her to an abandoned building after breaking into the residence. When Frank arrives at the facility, he discovers Stephanie entangled in a massive spider web. Quentin emerges, transformed into a horrible cross between a man and a spider, and begs Frank to kill him. This is where the film becomes quite sluggish. This is also a squandered opportunity since it takes so long to gain his powers. It happens around the half hour mark, which is way too late in the movie for this kind of revelation. It could have been condensed considerably more and maintained moving much faster. As it is, the film's opening could have been flashy, as the significant action takes too long to arrive. Then a long, drawn out revelation of what's going on makes this a genuinely long sit through, especially compared to the fast paced and dramatic finish. But there are a few pretty fascinating moments in this. In the final half hour, the most delicate sections are where things start to heat up, and the action becomes significantly more intense. The chase sequence that follows is enjoyable, but the actual highlight is the terrifying walkthrough of the buildings with no lights and only a flashlight. It's a long, drawn-out scenario with all the cliches of a tense moment playing out to their most total capacity, and is a genuinely fantastic sequence. From the moment the body is discovered wrapped in webbing in a gloomy, dingy factory, it creates an excellent mood that genuinely nails it perfectly. Earth vs. the Spider's characterization is surprisingly detailed. We begin the film feeling a little bad for Quentin, and we only grow to pity him more as the film progresses. <laughs> Detective Grillo, played by Aykroyd, is the prototypical hard luck officer who has lost his partner and his nerve. On the other hand, however, Grillo becomes more than a sad comic relief in the hands of a veteran like Dan Aykroyd. Unfortunately, the rest of the actors were not as talented. The plot of Earth vs. the Spider is based on Spider-Man Gone Awry. It's amusing to speculate what would have been if our beloved Peter Parker's change had been more superficial than it was, but as it is, we're just not wired to care. Even Aykroyd and Gummersall's melancholy is insufficient. Earth vs. the Spider fails to be anything, even itself. 
in its attempt to be the fly. For the most part, Devin Gummersall's acting is strong, and despite his little screen time, John Cho eats every scene that he's in, and plays a vital role in character Quentin's residual sanity. According to a report, Dan Aykroyd appears to be tossed into this film just for name recognition, portraying a private eye who becomes interested in Quentin's crime spree. He feels weirdly slapped onto this tale, and his only contribution is a misplaced noir style that is entirely inappropriate for what amounts on a gross-out horror flick. Aside from the title, this remake of the 1958 cult hit bears little resemblance to the original. If you can forgive it for stealing from Cronenberg's masterpiece, Earth vs. the Spider is an excellent genre piece that is less about science playing God and more about the implications of missing the ability to distinguish between reality and fantasy. Amelia Heinley, the female protagonist, and Denise Richards, the lookalike, give a truly outstanding performance as the neighbor with a heart of gold who wants to help our lead out. Her peaceful, laid-back persona is a refreshing break from the screaming blonde heroines generally seen in the current horror movies. Teresa Russell also makes a brief cameo as an unlikely and sightly insane figure. The few deaths of the film are primarily off-screen, with very little gore. The transformation effects are appropriately disgusting. Dan Aykroyd, Devin Gummersall, Amelia Hanley, Teresa Russell, Christopher Cousins, Mario Racuzzo, John Cho, Randall Huber, Zaya Harris, Floyd Lowe Jr., Michael Keenan, Ted Rooney, Dan Martin, and Rob Hill all star in Earth vs. the Spider. All of these actors do excellent work. In this flick, Aykroyd is outstanding. The film is well shot, and the music is terrific. The film is pretty engaging, and it keeps you well interested until the very end. This is an excellent and entertaining flick. Stay still. Remember? Remember what you told me about spiders and prey? The movie is most engaging when it explores Quentin's connection with his lady friend next door, whom he's hesitant to ask out. The entire film might have been based on this one event, and it would have been just acceptable. However, another aspect of the narrative is with the inquiry of Dan Aykroyd's character, which ultimately comes to naught. What's more bothersome is the climax's overall weirdness. Like the rest of the film, the last sequence is haphazard, hurried, and demeaning of the spectator. When Earth vs. the Spider concludes, there will be a lot to explain. The question is, of course, if the narrative has piqued your interest enough for you to care. Earth vs. the Spider was the first of five made-for-TV films created by Creature Features, which isn't very memorable. The only similarity between this creature and the original Earth vs. the Spider is just the title. Carrie Solomon, Chuck Konzelman, Max Ensko, and Annie DeYoung are divided into two portions. The first half of Earth vs. the Spider is essentially a low-rent, low-budget Spider-Man, involving superhuman powers, crime fighting after suffering an injustice, having a crush on a good-looking girl, but being unable to do anything about it due to what's happening around him, and keeping his powers a secret, and then of course, all the comic book references found throughout. Scott Zeal directed this film, and it has an odd feel to it because some of the props used indicate the 1940s and 1950s period film, such as the old-fashioned camera and Quentin's ancient-looking TV set, while the cars, clothes, and scientific equipment would lead one to believe that it's set in modern times. However, Zeal just couldn't decide. There isn't much blood or gore to speak about. However, the spider creature's special effects makeup are rather spectacular. Earth vs. the Spider is a picture that effectively steals the most significant concepts from far better films. It gives the impression that it has all been seen before, even while viewing it. The type of film that will keep you entertained for an hour and a half, but will be forgotten in a week. Mediocre at best. It's not simply the monster that this aspiring hero transforms into, it's the hero transforming into the monster that gives this film its punch. You root for Quentin as he begins to live his goal, but your heart bleeds and you're terrified for him when he transforms even more than he expected and begins to lose all values in life. There's one moment in particular where he grows mandibles and has a sorrowful talk with his worried neighbor and crush on the other side of his door, understanding he messed up and genuinely missed out on being with her. It's like a low-rent Spider-Man, but without Spidey's typically optimistic view, and it's what could happen if the Spider-Man talents included a horrific metamorphosis and a craving for live victims. There are actually some odd parallels between the two films. For instance, this one is from 2001, and Spider-Man came out in 2002. But who knows what the hype was like in Hollywood before the releases. So, we have a hero-villain combo with pathos in this one, a remake of the 1950s original in title only, with Dan Aykroyd in a good piece as a character actor, something he's been doing well since Driving Miss Daisy, since he's become too big to be a leading man any longer. It contains a traditional B-movie structure, and has a delayed revelation with the ugly man slash spider monster, which is definitely worth the wait in the grand Stan Winston tradition. 
As previously noted, this film is steadily comparable to The Fly, in which a tragic young man loses his love due to his transformation into a monster. He was also a lonely, mousy type of guy, similar to Jeff Goldblum. However, unlike The Fly, this film was not released in theaters across the country and did not have a large budget. On the other hand, Dan Aykroyd is having a good time hamming it up as the scared officer in a terrible marriage who pursues the monster as it murders and kills. However, it is interesting to note that Night of the Creeps and Vault of Horror are the two excellent receptions utilized in this picture. The film is not for everyone unfamiliar with or dislike primary sources, classic horror films from the Friday the 13th era, but fans of the genre will definitely be pleased. It's the classics, more accurately, a remake of a classic, a low-budget television horror film. The fantastic effects in Earth vs. the Spider are, of course, the real stars. Viewers may expect and receive a lot of genuine and exciting material, which Stan Winston oversees. Quentin's metamorphosis is hesitant to begin, but when he does, he is not the only one appalled and terrified by his body modifications. The add-ons are incredibly significant. The featurette, while brief, is entertaining, especially for horror enthusiasts. The photo gallery is very intriguing to fans, and the filmographies allow you to recall where you've seen that star previously. It's also convenient to have both the full screen and the widescreen versions of the same disc, rather than the studio marketing two separate DVDs. With Stan Winston on board, the practical effects, prosthetics, and makeup are considerably better, especially when it comes to the gooey stuff. Cobwebs, expanding mandibles, additional appendages, and dried corpses all look fantastic, or adequately cheesy, however you look at it. Surprisingly, there's almost too much character development as the picture develops, even though it generates sympathetic parts. The thrills and violence are far apart for a schlocky sci-fi horror mix. Nevertheless, the end product is a solid little chiller, frequently employing a less is more strategy that works surprisingly well with its limited resources. The film is a blatant rip-off of Spider-Man and the Fly. The combination of conventional horror movie characteristics, such as jump scares, eerie music, piercing cries, flashes of disturbing imagery, mostly flashback scenes, strange shadows, and unexpected assaults combines well with humor and action. The sci-fi absurdity has a self-aware air to it, and a touch of desperation and anxiousness, which makes the hero and his dilemma all the more compelling. What if Spider-Man became the Fly is a constant concept. It's a great twist, and it's handled with remarkable skill. While we wouldn't say it's creative by any means, this is an entertaining little film with characters, tales, and frightening makeup. All of this boils down to Earth vs. the Spider being a modern B-movie that is reasonably entertaining at first, but worsens as the film goes on. In some ways, a bad story, although not ideal by any means, is great for a time of watching bad science fiction movies. If you enjoyed our analysis today, please subscribe to Marvelous Videos. Send a like and comment what you think our next video should be. For Marvelous Videos, have a good one, be safe, and thanks for watching.